Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on LS engine failures and remedies. My name is Amanda Goyette. I am an admin assistant here at AERA, and I will be moderating today's event with my colleague, Rob Monroe. Hey, everyone. Yeah, Rob Monroe here. I look after membership and technical development over at AERA. Just a couple slides I'm going to go through just to kind of bring you up to speed on what's going on at AERA. Uh, just a few of them, and then we'll get Scott Steyer over, and uh, we'll get on with today's presentation. So um, to let you know that uh, a couple of the other things that we've got for technical information is we have our Engine Professional podcast. So on there is our, our techs, Steve Fox and Chuck Lynch, and uh, they just finished up episode 23 here not that long ago on engine testing. So they cover all the steps needed once everything's all together. Once you've got the engine together, they go over testing. They also do some uh, industry events. They cover a lot of the what's upcoming, as well as some of the events that we've just been at. As well as, I know, episode 23, they just covered the retirement of one of our longtime techs, Dave Hagen. So Dave was a 34-year veteran of AERA. He was our senior tech and is now enjoying the life of leisure. He's off fishing and, and doing the kind of stuff that people, uh, when you get a chance to retire, get to do. So. Hats off to Dave for that. Uh, another thing I want to mention is our quarterly giveaways. So uh, every quarter, any member or member who's renewing for that quarter gets a chance to uh, to be uh, basically in the draw for one of our quarterly prizes. So the last one that we did was actually the uh, the Elgin uh, Industries. We want to thank them. They donated uh, one of their sloppy two camshafts and valve spring kits for us. And a company, uh, one of our members, High Plains Performance in Goodlit, Kansas, actually won that. So congratulations to them. Uh, our Q3 giveaway prize is going to be a valve seat concentricity gauge from Robbins. And uh, so that'll be the next one. And uh, we'll be doing that draw on October 1st for that next batch. So if you want any information on how that works or, or just how, it, you know, what, with more information for that, you can go to our website to aera.org and it's right there on that front page for you to look at. All right, well, enough uh, chit chat out of me. I know I can get talking and get a little long winded. So Scott Steyer, uh, he's on today and he's from Elgin Industries and Scott is a tech advisor over there at Elgin. And uh, we always look forward to any of our presentations that we get from our, our manufacturers. And so Scott's gonna do a presentation on, today on, a, on the L LS camshaft failures and remedies. And uh, if you've got any questions for Scott, like I mentioned, Get those in that questions box. We'll save those to the end, and uh, we'll get we'll get those over and get Scott to get those answered for you. So, Scott, how are things going today? Excellent, Rob. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, no, things are things are going good. So, um, I can see your screen. Everything looks good there. Sound is good. So, okay. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, AERA. My fellow Americans. Canadians, inhabitants of Earth, and intelligence beyond the event horizon of our known universe. Welcome to this webinar. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or account of this game without written consent of Major League Baseball is prohibited. The information in this webinar is from the accumulated experiences and feedback from original equipment manufacturers such as General Motors, original equipment suppliers, such as Elgin Industries, production engine remanufacturers, end users in the field, engine builders, and machine shops. I am not an engine builder. I am a parts guy, a professional parts guy if there was ever one could be. I'm fourth generation in the automotive hobby and industry, and today I'll share with my fellow AERA membership some good things to know about the LS engine parts, both their failures and today's innovation. It's summer here in the Northern Hemisphere where the barbecue pits and the mini bikes, mini skirts, Tennessee whiskey, and the Miller Lite. We are in peak season for car events, car shows, car tours, car racing, cruise nights, coffee and cars, motorsports experiences all encompassing. We laid rubber on the Georgia asphalt. We got a little crazy, but we never got caught. All of which the LS engine is growing in popularity. Because the LS engine is more budget-friendly horsepower 
than a four-speed dual-quad Posi Traction 409, and the LS engine has superb reliability compared to a little deuce coupe with a flathead mill. The LS engine has been helping us enjoy our cars at the Surf and Safari Drag Nationals Woodward Cruise in the Coast, because for most of us in the Northern Hemisphere, half of the year is not conducive to car events. When the weather outside is frightful, driving in it is less than delightful. Because not only is driving hazardous for all of us, today we'll discuss additional hazards that the snow and ice may cause for engine builders. Because many engines that may end up at your shop for a rebuild, and many engines that will someday power a hot rod, are out there today in daily drivers. Because that snow and ice and dirt and grime freezes to our cars and trucks and slowly rusts them away, which is more than a cosmetic issue. Along with plowing the snow from our roadways, the surfaces are treated with chemicals to melt and dissolve the snow and ice. Water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Rock salt only melts snow to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Temps here in Elgin, Northern Illinois, will drop below zero for months. So magnesium and calcium are added to melt ice to sub-zero temperatures, and it turns the snow and ice into this semi-liquefied, highly corrosive slush that you see coming off this row of snowplows. This slush takes on many shapes and forms because of its semi-liquid state, and it will find its way into more places than snow alone. The first issues reported came to Elgin from high-end vehicles in the Northeast Corridor. These are GMC Yukon Denali, Cadillac Escalades. These are vehicles built after 2006 that are equipped with Active Fuel Management, or AFM. These are vehicles that once they are over 10 years old are now requesting an Active Fuel Management, or AFM, delete. The inside of a driver's door on any fully loaded vehicle is already susceptible to the shock and abrasion caused by both the door being slammed and also taking the brunt of the salt spray from the oncoming traffic. So does the rear hatch. So does the ride control. So does the body control module. The ECM, the PCM, so does the engine control. I've seen a trailer socket on the bumper of a pickup truck be so corroded that the corrosion itself had worked its way up under the wire insulation eight inches from the socket itself. Now what happens when the computer goes haywire on an AFM, active fuel management system? Shouldn't the GM have designed and included some sort of fuse to protect the hard parts from the software? What's the spring for on the end of this lifter? To absorb the slack when the AFM turns on and off. What happens when that on-off timing is incorrect? The ratchets inside the lifter will lock the spring collapse. The fuse has popped. The engine is saved. So when you open up an engine and you see this collapsed lifter, you need to explain to your customer that they likely have an electrical issue and that you can rebuild their engine with high-quality OE replacement parts and that you will address any other issues within the engine, but the customer also needs to look at the vehicle electrical because if they don't find the root cause, then the fuse will blow again, and we have seen this issue again and again. And if the customer doesn't fix it, or if you leave the AM in, AFM in place without deleting the AFM, the customer will come charging back to your shop, asking if you're going to stand behind their engine, and you need to explain to them again about the electrical. And since many shops are family operations, maybe your brother will be standing behind you, nodding and applauding because he's heard the story again and again. So remember, the engine part and the, and the builder both did their job correct. It's, the engine, it's likely the engine oil control electrical that caused the failure. All right, here's an image of AFM to, do, to lead us to DFM. 
Normally, the lifters are locked in the taller functional position by internal springs and pins. When the computer decides to deactivate the cylinders, it needs to turn off oil flow to those lifters. The computer tells a solenoid to shut off that oil flow. All of the AFM solenoids are housed on this plate, located beneath the intake manifold on top of the block. And it feeds this separate oil galley for the AFM portions of the lifters. This plate of solenoids is called the valve lifter oil manifold, or VLOM, VLOM, or VLOM. And it can also have issues. The VLOM has its own oil filter which can clog. The solenoids can fail. The oil galleys can clog. The VLOM can be tested or deleted. A blank plate will need to be installed to fill its gap. So on the AFM engines, the Gen 4, half of the cylinders have this spring and the system. The 2019 and newer engines are equipped with DFM. That's dynamic fuel management. It's all eight cylinders can deactivate, and all 16 lifters have the spring running on hundreds of different firing orders from all eight cylinders down to one cylinder. Again, in the newer GM V8s, all 16 lifters have this spring. This translates to a much higher duty cycle, and GM found out the hard way that the original AFM lifter was not strong enough to handle the speed and ferocity of multiple systems at once. Enter the Dragon, the newly redesigned DFM lifter for the higher demand dynamic fuel management engines. The new DFM lifter is the holy grail of both the AFM and DFM systems. The new DFM lifter is all jacked up on Mountain Dew, like with giant eagle's wings, and singing lead vocals for Leonard Skinner with an all-angel band. Enter the Elgin HL7025. Stronger, faster, GM redesigned it, and available at less cost than a million-dollar man. Available in the same budget pricing you've come to know from Elgin. Made in the USA. Backwards compatible to all previous AFM designs. If you are keeping the AFM system in your LS engine, this is the lifter to use. Available in tray quantities, sets of four, included with cam lifter kits, and all new lifter guide sets. These are all completely made in the USA to meet or exceed OE specifications. The latest technology from the GM DFM engine. At less cost than getting them from the dealership, pre-packed and ready to drop into your engine. When overhauling a standard AFM engine, use this 7026 kit. Or use the LS7 style lifter in the 2148 for a Gen 3 or non-AFM or AFM delete. If you choose to do a Smokey and the Bandit, the Blues Brothers, and the Dukes of Hazard have all done, that would be the make to make the jump. And for an LS engine, jump to delete the AFM altogether. The 2148, used in the AFM delete scenario, is packaged this way so that you can choose the camshaft that matches uh, your application, which we will get to momentarily. Before we discuss lifter failures, I've got some big news. The bank finally came through, and I'm holding the keys to a brand new Chevrolet Performance LS7 lifter. The Elgin HL2148 is again the most current version of the GM factory roller LS7 style lifter that is backwards compatible to the pre-Vortec Gen 2 small block Chevy lifters that use the Spider style retainer. The industry says LS7 style in quotations because it's the newest version of the standard production pickup truck lifter. It's this LS7 style lifter that is in most LS engines today from the factory. The actual LS7 lifter only goes into high performance engines like the 427 Corvette. And as of today, is newly available to the aftermarket from Elgin Industries 
as HL7028. So guys, write down this number. And uh, don't be mad uh, if your warehouse doesn't have pricing yet, uh, because this is this is the first announcement. Uh, putting this presentation together last night, I looked into it, I requested this. Uh, guys at the PRI show were, were, were asking me a lot about it, about when we were gonna carry it. Uh, it took my purchasing department a while to negotiate it and track it down. This was shortly after the PRI show. Um, as of May, we made the deal. Um, they are on the shelf. I have a lot of them now. Uh, so if you want to get them, uh, give your give your warehouse a jingle or call me. It's not in the current price list uh, because uh, we just we just it just went live <laughs> uh, as of the computer backup of last night. So this is this is the lifter that's that 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 could be matched to builds in a different way. This is going to be the ones that are going to match the really high end performance cams, the ones with really big lift and really long duration. It's going to match those uh, the springs that you may have seen the the releases on those super finished springs that we'll also get to later. So we'll get back to this, but I did add, I did want to add this slide here within the last few minutes uh, to let you guys know. HL7028 is the actual LS7 lifter. We are continuing production. We do still have all made in USA inventory on the HL2148. That's the, the lifter that you guys all know. That's the one that you've come to expect, uh, that you've gotten used to. That is still going to be the big production number. This one is going to be a little bit more dollar-wise, but it's going to be a lot more uh, performance-wise. So. A little cheerleading there for that. Before we get to failure, we're going to be like doing lifter failures four times today, so you'll get used to seeing the slide. Um, but again, the Elgin HL2148 LS7 style lifter made in the USA. Uh, we haven't had any issues from it. If we did, I'm sure that the production engine remanufacturer guys would be, I'd be hearing about it. We would all be hearing about it. Um, but they do fail, and when we do get them back and we look at them, uh, we find out that the causes for lifter are collateral. And that's a pattern that we're going to continue to see today uh, as we discuss more in depth on the failures on camshafts and other valve trains. And also mention that uh, all of these cams and lifters are made in the USA to meet or exceed OE specifications. The quality you'd expect from your GM dealer at a fraction of the cost. So onward. Camshafts, uh, quick ID on cams, things to look for when doing an AFM delete. The Gen 3 has the old Gen 2 style step nose with three holes for the sprocket. It has the sensor pickup on the camshaft itself located at the rear of the engine, a logical place following the distributor gear location on the original small block Chevy. The Gen 4, aka AFM engines, have the sensor pickup located on the sprocket. That's these four little notches you see here, the two short squares and then the, the two longer uh, lines. Um, and that sprocket only has a single bolt. That cam and sprocket only have a single bolt. Some of the lower production engines do have a three bolt sprocket that also included the reluctor pickup. That's this one over here on the far right. So you have your one, two, three, four. You have your pickups, your reluctor pickups for the sensor, uh, but it does have, the uh, the three bolt um, interface. So the three bolt can go back to the LS1 cams that they make. They make lots of cams. We offer lots of cams for for that application. So if you're doing an AFM delete, you'll likely need to use the three bolt sprocket uh, that also has the sensor pickup uh, to use one of these any of the performance cams or some of the AFM delete. Outside the mechanical parts on an AFM delete. You might also need to add a pigtail wire adapter to the timing cover itself for the pickup to read correctly. Then you'll need to retune the computer. The moral of the story is there are many AFM delete kits available, and Elgin supplies those valve train components a la carte. So you'll need to identify which engine you have in your shop and maybe what vehicle it's going to be installed into so that you can match the correct kit and the adapters to that application. And now the moment some of you have been waiting for, camshaft failures. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The good part, uh, Elgin, USA camshaft production is an excellent. Right now we are in the golden age of horsepower. I don't think there's any way they can not deny it when we're looking at the big three duking it out at the drag strip just like uh, the Trans Am cars used to do back around 1970. Uh, we have camshaft grinds for every application. 
Uh, Camsel will make a basic truck engine into a race dominator for every budget. Uh, the bad part is that any cam is still susceptible to collateral failure, as we've already seen, and uh, we'll continue to, to, to discuss next. And the ugly part, MadeInChina.com, is counterfeiting Elgin and more. So let's start right in with those. Import camshaft. Let me start by saying that anyone can reuse a part number. There's nothing we can do about that. That's been an industry sort of standard uh, going all the way back. Um, anyone can reuse a part number, but they cannot use the Elgin brand name. Uh, there are counterfeit camshafts all over the internet, particularly eBay and Amazon. Um, and if you're looking at them, you can't just identify them by the price alone because there are made in China cams from the same company where you could buy it for a third of the price that they mark up the price to like 20 bucks off of a regular Elgin cam. So you're like, oh, here's an Elgin cam for $20 off the, the lowest price I see. Well, in reality, you're just buying a China cam for like double, triple what, what you could be buying it for from the same person. They've, they've got, they, they, the pricing is all screwed up on it. So um, a couple of years ago, the phone started ringing with failures and I do answer the tech line here at Elgin. Uh, so I, I'm always open to, to answering questions as best as I can. Uh, and, and there were some failures that were out there. And, and you know, a lot of the, the LS stuff is, as it always has been, done in a two-car garage by people that have some engine experience or that they're tra tackling it for the first time. But I noticed that the frequency of the calls was increasing suddenly uh, and for a wider variety of failures. So we kind of looked into it and found the, the counterfeits. They were the ones that, that were suspect to be counterfeit by warehouses that, that had pointed it out to us. Um, so we ordered a few. <laughs> we ordered a few. We sent them not here to, to Elgin directly, but, but to, to coworkers, and, and we, uh, we brought them in. So I unboxed them, and I helped them walk across the, uh, the building to our lab because we do have, as a Tier 1 OE supplier, uh, we do have a, a full lab here with uh, all the different instruments and whatnot. So I showed it to one of the, we gave it to one of the lab techs for him to look at with uh, the XRF and the coordinate and a, a few other machines. And one of the lab techs said, this is the worst looking cam I ever saw, which was funny, except that Elgin, or me specifically, that I'm getting the calls when the Chinese fakes fail. And uh, the number of calls is getting alarming. I can say that much. My, the look on my face a lot of times when these guys call is the same as Rodney Dangerfield here. Um, so I, I, put, I listed some of those on the right here. Uh, the timing issues, of course, uh, would be found when you're degreeing in a cam. If you started you know, looking at it, you're like, you would notice immediately all the timing issues. Uh, but the other issues, you, you, the, a typical shop would not be able to f find until the engine fails. And uh, I distinctively remember um, the first time I had a call about a China cam, uh, the guy said he, the cam locked when he tightened down the sprocket. And so he contacted the seller online, and the seller told him that he needed an offset sprocket and to call Elgin to get the right part number and then call them back. Offset sprockets don't exist. <laughs> I don't know if they thought that we would magically make one that would work with their application since obviously they re -eng reverse engineered it and they, they, they screwed up some of it. But um, I asked the guy, you know, a few more questions before I realized it was bad and, you know, read me the numbers off the back of the cam, a few other identifying marks, and it was totally blank. And he said that uh, that he was really surprised. He thought the cams were made in the USA. The, the cam box was totally blank and it, all it said was made in China. Well, that was the first red flag, of course, and I, the rest I've told you since then. So. Um, I guess the, the, the end of it, uh, the scariest issue on this list is the, uh, for me is the heat treat because I saw it when we cross-sectioned. Uh, it clearly revealed that the China heat treat is likely done by waving a hot wand across the noses of the lobes and loosely around the journals. Uh, the base circles on the lobes had basically no heat treat whatsoever. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's not good. That's that's I can't ex express. I'm sure that if anyone knows about heat treat, no, well, that's bad. <laughs> um, that's the definition of a soft cam, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Um, the way that we do it, a genuine Elgin cam is rotated while passing through an induction ring. 
and the speed is shifted to maximize the coverage. So, back to our LS7 style lifter. Again, we'll see the slide a few times because lifter failure tends to be due to uh, damage uh, because of its interfaces being susceptible to collateral damage uh, from failures on these other mating components. That made in China cam lobe that I was just talking about, uh, it might look smooth and uh, you might run your finger across it and it might feel okay. Uh, just like looking at a gravel road from an airplane might let, make it look smooth. But if you're driving on the gravel road, you're going to feel those washboard vibrations. And that will shake you or shake and bake your lifter. And it will fail sooner rather than later from either flat spots on the needle bearings or chips in the roller uh, or lobe surfaces like you see on this one. Uh, or it could fracture a valve spring. We've, we saw that quite a, quite a few of those. Uh, or any other valve train damage. Anything that's going to be a shock. Uh, but back to the Made in China camshaft. Uh, here, here is the months, several weeks, close to months, with uh, in between time of testing summed up into one sentence. That sentence there. Uh, China doesn't care if their product fails because they don't have a warranty. That just means that they can sell you the parts again. But what's the cost of your labor? You want to know why China parts don't have a guarantee? Because all they, they, because they know all they sold you was a guaranteed piece of junk. That's all it is. Hey, if you want me to take a dump in a box and mark it guaranteed, I will. I got the spare time. But for right now, for your sake, for your daughter's sake, you might want to think about buying a quality item from me. Next type of camshaft failure, collateral damage. Hopefully all engine builders are aware of this next important equation because this is what happens when part of that equation is missing. This is not an LS cam. It is one that the guys in our lab thought appropriate. And after reading it, I realized that the guys in our lab had written the perfect country and western song, and I felt obliged to include it here on this album. The next verse goes like this here. The right oil, in the right place, at the right time, in the right amount. All right, that wasn't our lab. It was Lake Speed Jr., superhuman engine building engineer extraordinaire, and I'll use this moment to thank Lake for sharing his knowledge with all of us and to thank the AERA for providing a platform for all of us to share this information together. We now resume our regular scheduled programming. The camshaft here on the screen was part of that uh, missing oil equation. Uh, the cross-section of loads shows that the material was free of defect and the heat treat was at spec. When a cam gets returned to Elgin for post-failure analysis, this is what we can measure. And we read the signatures left by outside forces or most frequently, lack of oil. More collateral lift, lifter failure. This is the third time we've seen this LS7 lifter slide because it also touches this next camshaft lifter combination failure, the lifter guides. These are my picks uh, of the first round table failure session for me here at Elgin uh, over half a decade ago. The engineers in, uh, invited me to one of their component evaluation reviews and said, you wanna see something? This is what happens when a lifter rides on the lobe sideways. And my reaction was like that of Steve Martin and John Candy in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Wow, well, isn't that something? Uh, because in the LS engine, uh, the lifter guide is plastic, and it will fatigue with age. And we've seen lifters spin in their bores with the same results as this, lift, as this camshaft and lifter combination that you see here on the screen. And here is an LS cam, high mileage, albeit, uh, reported to have had the AFM lifters and guides replaced back when you couldn't get some in 2020 when things were really bad. Uh, so they chose not to use an OE replacement. Uh, instead, they used uh, import valve uh, lifter guides. So back to China. The top black guide is one of those import guides. The bottom gray guide is OE. And again, as earlier with the camshaft, 
China can, refute, can reuse the part number as you can see in this middle picture here. Dimensionally, these two parts are basically identical, which is easy for China to reverse engineer or replicate with a computer coordinate measuring machine. However, they could not perfectly copy the plastic material. The China guide is missing a key polymer that is required for the structural integrity under the standard workload, and they know that. They know that they made this out of the same junk plastic as a toy from the dollar store. And they know that this guide will fail under regular conditions of your engine at working temperature and definitely fail as you're approaching 7,000 RPM. The picture on the right tells you that. They don't sign the part. Any reputable manufacturer will put their mark on their part. China doesn't want traceability because they don't want accountability. And that's why they don't offer for a guarantee. But for right now, again, for your sake, for your customer's sake, you might want to think about buying quality LS engine parts from Elgin. The Elgin lifters and lifter guides meet and exceed OE specifications. They meet and exceed the exact specifications provided by the GM engineers. Same material, same finish, the same lifespan, the same. Elgin lifters and guides are made in the USA. Elgin engine parts carry a lifetime warranty. Which is why we offer them in these sets. Again, here's the second time you're seeing this HLG hydraulic lifter guide and lifter set slide, but this time it's because now we've just discussed the importance of replacing the lifter guides with the lifters at the same time. We pack them this way so that you can choose the specific camshaft for so many choices and only have to pick one of these two sets. The 2148 is the LS1, Gen 3, and AFM Delete. The 7026 is for AFM engines and it uses that better DFM lifter. So that, friends, are the biggest causes for LS engine failures. AFM failures, guide failures, and China failures. Here's a couple slides for choosing an LS cam. Cue the dramatic music from Star Wars, Star Trek, Space Odyssey, or Space Oddity, or any epic galactic drama theme of your preference. For the e Elgin E1840P, known universally as the Sloppy Stage 2 part of a family of Elgin camshafts made popular by the sloppy mechanic and coined the name after. It became popular for adding 60 horsepower to naturally aspirated engines, then add boost or turbo from turbo or blower and a little nitrous spray and the same cam is good to over 1,000 wheel horsepower. 20 years ago when I worked at a machine shop sweeping the floors, uh, eight seconds in the quarter mile is a hundred thousand bucks. Today these guys are doing it for eight thousand and it'll pass an NHRA tech line. These are easily running in the nines and driving them on the street with the kids to go get ice cream in the evening. This cam has transcended the universe, spanning the space-time continuum. We know this because a shop in Guadalajara, Mexico has been sending us videos of them installing it into a DeLorean equipped with straight pipes resembling the remnants of the flux capacitor. Along with all the sloppy stage 1, 2, and 3 cams, Elgin offers all the LSX crate motor cams, which are amazing in their own right. They have great chop, they have great performance, and that's because they have OE part numbers that you see on the screen here. Uh, it's very easy for any builder to just take the OE part number or the exact LSX combo that, 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 that I've listed here for you uh, and just copy the GM build from the parts breakdown. Just build it. You'll have an LSX crate motor for a fraction of the price. So, when you're rolling down a backwoods, Tennessee byway, one arm on the wheel, whether you're getting that vintage muscle car back on the road or you're looking to dominate the universe in your modern muscle car while those windshield wipers are slapping on a tempo, keeping perfect rhythm with the song on the radio, Elgin has a cam to give you superpowers. Congratulations to Matt from High Plains Performance. 
Matt just won a sloppy stage two with matching valve springs in the AERA quarterly giveaway mentioned by Rob at the beginning of this webinar. If Matt or anyone else, for that matter, has any questions about LSF building, I can email them a basic guide that includes part numbers, tips, links to build sheets, videos, and more about the, this camshaft and valve spring combination. Real quick, the valve springs are a recent chapter in and of themselves because anytime you change the cam, I'm sure you all know you should install the springs. Uh, to match the recommended pressures by the camshaft. And all of our cams are matched to this spring. This is the new, from Elgin, super finished drop-in replacement. Always used with chrome molly retainers. This spring handles big cams with the super long lifespan expected of a stock OE spring. And the performance to match the high lift and steep ram profiles, all for an Elgin budget-friendly price. So yeah, if you recognize the part number on this, it's because that's who developed it. This is the cleanest spring wire in the world. It is free from any inclusion. Uh, it's ovate. It's, it's the best spring you can buy. It's good to any camshaft that, that we have in our catalog, except for the LSX454R. That's the one that has three quarters of an inch of lift. You're on your own with that one. Um, but this is all the rest of the street cam. Anything that you use with our lifters, anything you use with, with, with all of our cams, this is the spring to use going forward. This slide is to get your attention. If you're an adult swimmer and you know this race, based on the Cannonball Run, and actually did star the voices of Burt Reynolds, Dom DeLuise, Macaulay Culkin, Seth Green, Ashton Kutcher, and others, you email me and I'll mail you some Elgin Pro Stock decal. Real quick, uh, straight LS1 and offset LS1. Three engine OE replacement rocker arms. We've seen them hold up at 7,000 RPM, but that's when the engine builder should start thinking about switching to a full roller setup. Uh, the top set is the drop-in. Those tend to sell out quickly every time we do a batch. Um, the stud-mounted one style is uh, the same body that's shared with all the rest of the SSR line. Um, those are more frequently found in stock. Um, those are those are require studs and guide plates. Um, all of these part numbers are in the LS catalog on our website. If you want to know more, let me know. Uh, but like I said, again, the stock rocker that you see on the left, stock OE replacement, we've seen it be good to 7,000 RPM with no issues. So you can use them. <laughs> this is the fourth time we've seen this slide and the last time I promise, because this is the last of the failures that we'll discuss today. Valve train instability. Elgin Industries is an OE supplier. We work directly with the original equipment manufacturers to develop engine platforms that will go into production a half a decade or more into the future. We make about a half a million push rods a week. We've seen every possible way for a push rod to fail, and we have successfully re-engineered push rods for all of those applications. So we know how to design them for the long haul and perform under any condition. And for LS engines, you do need to know a couple things about push rods. Uh, on a stock LS7 style lifter, uh, the HL2148, uh, the stock lash is 050. Performance lash, we're finding, uh, depending on the ramp profile of the cam, should be somewhere between 070 and 100. Uh, and the full travel of that HL2148 is 120 to 150,000. So with the stock rod measuring 7.393 from the factory, often referred to as a 7400, like I have it here, um, here's your good, better, and best replacements. You know, you have your stock replacement, then you have hardened, then you have the one piece thick wall that is centerless ground from seamless chrome molly. These are the push rods we ship around the world. These are the ones that go into actual pro stock engines. Uh, so you can buy good enough or you can buy them once. Um, I do encourage you to measure the length because oftentimes that steeper ramp pro profile of the sloppy stage two will like to have that more uh, lash than lifter preload uh, so that 050 longer push rod will quiet down the, the clatter. And in the one piece thick wall, we offer them in 025 increments uh, to accommodate for changes in valve train geometry, such as changing the head gasket thickness or switching to those roller rockers that we saw on the last slide. Uh, and one more quick thing, though, on the one piece thick wall, these nicer ones, uh, the part number is the uh, measurement. So one is for one piece, five is for 516, 740 is for 7400. We do offer it also in a 3 8 push rod um, in all the popular lengths for your big block Chevy, et cetera. Next. Uh, oh, push rods transcend all engine building as universal parts for all vehicles. 
more than just fluids, push rods, valve guides, seats, and springs, and more engine parts that Elgin has to offer. THX1138. Incidentally, the car on the left of this slide is now an antique, and it shouldn't really be a grudge race of Forger versus Chevy versus Dodge for another because we're approaching the era of gas versus electric and right to repair. For whatever that's worth, that's something to look into um, for all of us engine builders and vehicle enthusiasts, et cetera, uh, is an important topic uh, that's out there in legislation now and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. So. Alongside the new LS engines, there's probably other engines in your shop, um, which is when the universal parts uh, are found in the tech section of our catalog real quick. Uh, I do get a lot of questions about being able to navigate this. This is the free technical resource in our online catalog. Uh, it is our entire catalog, including the stuff that's not cataloged under year, make, and model. Um, so I wanted to show this because I know I have a lot of engine builders, hopefully, on the line today. It defaults as engine and catalog, but you can you can click pick part lookup and, and type in your part number and see what it fits, or part, part uh, select technical lookup, and then this is a drop down. Dr drop down and select whatever you're looking for. I, I selected push rods, and then you can you can choose narrowing your search. So I said measure le measured length greater than 7400, and it gave me 47 pages of results. So then you can sort by construction, tube size material, et cetera, to, to narrow it down. Actually, you can choose from two different measurements up here and then the third from down here. So there's a lot of information in here, guys. If you're working on a, a really obscure cylinder head and you're looking for valve seats or valve guides for it, you can look in the catalog and, and, and see, have we ever made something? Is there something that, that may be available? Write down all the part numbers. Give me a call right here at this 800 number or email me here at this website. I'll, I, even if you don't buy direct, I'll be glad to tell you what's available so that you can contact your warehouse and say, Elgin says they have these available. I need to order them. It's as easy as that. And if you ever, you know, if you ever, you know, need help navigating this, give me a call and I'll be glad to do it with you live, so that you feel more comfortable using on it. Because there's like 70,000 part numbers in here, which is a lot. So, and it's there for your advantage, so you know what, what's available when you're working on obscure stuff. So, that being said, um. Lastly, I'll touch on a little bit of our company history. Elgin Industries has been owned and operated by the same family in the same town for over 100 years. Our founder, Martin Skoke Sr., was working in the automotive industry from its infancy, and by the late teens, that's over 100 years ago, uh, the 1919, uh, he was managing a city garage for a dealer that was for several brands, including Buick and Hudson. Recognizing the need for higher quality replacement parts, he rented this tiny little carriage house house, which is still standing today, uh, and started exploring new manufacturing processes for auto parts. In 1919, Skoke founded Elgin Machine Works, and his new products that were so successful that he went from renting buildings over 10 years to constructing a brand new state-of-the-art factory of his own design, and was making parts for every form of transportation. Martin Skoke's innovative methods refined grinding processes, specifically centerless grinding, and at the same time, he improved heat treatment. This is very old, that's over 100 years old. Obviously, it looks a lot different today in our building. Um, so by the 1930s, Skoke had expanded his manufacturing to include in-house packaging and distribution, as well as campaigning championship race cars, uh, which some of the guys you might recognize there on the left. Um, now, instead of you know testing our parts out on the racetrack, um, we're developing them alongside with the original equipment manufacturer. Uh, but we do still do grassroots sponsorships. Uh, there's several of them going on uh, throughout the summer through a company called Contingency Connection. Um, there's where are we at? Tier 1, OE supplier. Uh, we have 150,000 square feet under one roof here at the main facility, uh, which is where the offices are, which is where I'm sitting right now, um, over by the far right-hand side of the picture. Uh, we're making the half a million push rods for a week. Our biggest platforms right now on the OE side for those push rods would be the Hemi, the Scorpion, and the Godzilla from Ford. Um, Ford, Chrysler, and Deere pick up every day from us. They're, they send a semi-truck every day with empty totes with our name and their part number, and then they pick up the full ones. Uh, and we put that same quality into our into the OE parts as well as the aftermarket. Engine and chassis products are our primary um, 
to manufacturing, engine parts including camshafts, lifters, push rods, rocker arms, valves and valve train, timing sets, oil pumps, engine gasket sets. On the chassis side, we supply steering suspension such as tie rods, ball joints, bushings, kingpins, and coil springs. Here's some of our quality certifications for those that are interested in that. Uh, CQI 9 is uh, heat treat and 15 below that is welding. Uh, for whatever it's worth, Q1, and even though it's only two digits, one letter, one digit, uh, that's Ford. That's the hardest one. That's everything else combined. Uh, being Ford Q1, being Q1 with Ford is, uh, is something to, to take note of. Uh, we employ a, 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 a quality lab engineers. We test every batch of parts. For surface hardness, case, case depth, surface finish, um, all the parts are made to meet and exceed OE specifications. They're all coming out of a plant that is OE. And that is all overseen by our, our own internal auditing team so that you can be assured that the same award-winning quality also goes into Elgin aftermarket performance parts. So we're talking about GM. We did not get it in 2020 because no one got it in 2020. GM didn't even get it for themselves in 2020. Uh, so we just got 22 on this. Uh, we just got 22 on Deer. Um, I don't know if we, we Ford we haven't seen yet. Ford's a little bit later. We're still mid year. We should see that. Um, on a memorable, not so recent visit by a few AERA members, I recall Chuck Lynch commented how he thoroughly enjoyed visiting with companies that make something where raw steel rolls in one end of the building and finished product goes out the other end. That's us. We are fully integrated, captive processes, and those are all just picks of the factory and lines. So the moral of the story is, if you're out there and you're building an LS engine, support your local machine shop and engine builder, because they are likely already connected to the Elgin Warehouse Distribution Network and they are an invaluable resource for engine building rather than, in, rather than the inconsistencies of cruise night keyboard commandos that never really drive their car, let alone rebuild engines for the long haul. And that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, AERA, for hosting Elgin Industries. All of our contact info has been on the bottom of all of these slides on the screen. Uh, if you email that sales at Elgin IND, that goes to several people. Uh, myself included, so we will direct your email to whoever needs to answer it. And uh, thank you for your time. Great job, Scott. Thank you. A um, lot of good information there. That one number that you mentioned a couple times, that 500,000 push rods per week, that's an eye-opener. I mean, I've, I've been through your facility as well, and it, when you see your push rod you know, line and, and what you're doing there, it you know, 2 million push rods a month is a whole lot of push rods. So that's pretty impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I walk around back there a lot of times on Fridays and um, it is, I still can't get enough of just the volume going to all the corners of the world. All these parts are going to all the corners of the world, powering police cars, ambulances, everything. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a need to be a part of it, just to be a little piece of the puzzle. Exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. Um, Scott, there are a couple questions that have rolled in if you've got a few minutes and, um, yeah, absolutely. sure. And some of these might be a little bit on the, um, uh, we can always get back to the folks. Like if some of these questions are, um, where we need the technical specification or measurement or something, we can always get Scott to get back to you. But, um, Scott, I'll, I'll just start sent. I'll just mention a few questions here for you. So the one gentleman, uh, is talking about, you mentioned, uh, that brand new lifter for the LS7, the 7028. Um, he's asking if you if if you know what the difference is between your 2148 LS7 style lifter and that new 7028. If you can, if there's anything to share there, what the difference is? Um, <laughs> I added that literally like an hour ago. Um, when I got here this morning, I looked into it. I found out that we've had them for a little bit. We just haven't. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, but but I'll, I'll say that one of our oldest Reman customers um, that we work with on, on some specialty stuff, uh, when they're using our performance cams with the traditional HL2148, they always use an 050 longer rod in, the, in those performance builds. 
And so what I tell guys when they call, if they're if end users when they're doing a or even install even shops when they're doing a, a swap and they what 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 to do about the push rod length is if if you're putting a performance cam in in the engine is to and you still have the original push rods that are in there is to start it with start the engine with the stock length rods and see if it clatters. Uh, if it does, which it probably will, um, then to go with an 050 longer push rod uh, that, that's hardened. If it doesn't clatter, if it's fine, if the engine is still tight, then you can get away with the stock rank length rod and just get it in a hardened version. That, that's the key, it's hardened either way. Because you know, if, if the engine is tight, that's one thing. If it's got a quarter million miles on it, which a lot of times an LS engine does, the, the oil could be bleeding out of all of the bearing, out of, out of all of the all of the parts of the engine, and uh, if it, it might not have enough, it might clatter no matter what length push rod in you put in there. I guess is what I'm getting at. So, um, or well, how much preload is what I was getting at. Well, how much preload you're putting on the lifter, no matter how much preload you put on the lifter, no matter how long the push rod is to get that length, um, you, you you might not be able to get to it. So, I'm I don't have the data yet. Uh, I'm really looking forward to to getting to getting these lifters here and getting them in the field with that remanufactured with that that engine builder that, that that we've had that our grandfathers our founder and their great grandfather whatever they they knew each other um so we work pretty closely we, we we share a lot of data with them and i will have data soon i just don't have it yet there probably is data out there if you were to google the oe part numbers um you know kind of going backwards from it which i can get you i can get you that oe part number if anyone wants to email me uh, I'll get you those interchange numbers because I do have those. I should have put those up on the screen here. I apologize. So, no, no worries, Scott. Sorry. Long answer for no nah. answer. <laughs> That's okay. What I'll do is I'll send you the gentleman's contact info afterwards. And, uh, and yeah, once you do get some information, at least you've got his contact info and, and you could possibly share that. So that that's great. Um, Another gentleman has asked if you know what sp what, what spring pressures are the stock rocker arms good for? And again, if, if this might be something you might have to research, and we can always send you the info later. But do you know offhand what the spring pressures for the for your stock rockers are good for? Well, I would think at least they've they've definitely I've definitely seen them survive beyond 300. I don't know about 325, but uh, very consistently uh, 300, because um, that's what the sloppy stage two that camshaft. Um, let me see what the ones that are in here that we're selling. Here, what is this? This one's 367 at 150. It might be that high. Uh, I'm positive that I've seen the. Um, I apologize, I don't know that number either. But surviving in builds out on the street, for sure. Um, that I have. You know, we have customers, end users that are building them. Uh, 320, consistently. So probably beyond 320 at least. So that's probably a safe place to start. But okay. it could be as all high right. as 367. If you want to forward that to me, I can do that one. I'll, I'll gladly do all of these. I'll do that one too. Sure. Yep. No worries. Um, and this next question, we get this on our tech line a lot. Um, and I don't know if we necessarily have. Uh, well, I'll, I'll ask the question, and then so they're asking, are you seeing LS camshaft bearing failures on performance builds? I haven't. Um, I do occasionally. I get brought in to look at some of the returns. I haven't seen failure stuff. I haven't noticed as much. Um, as much. Really, I don't. I can't even remember the last time that I saw a scored bearing journal come back to us uh, on an engine. So whether they are or they aren't. That I don't know. Uh, if they, uh, I'd be curious, you know, as to what's going on with that. I know that the, there is a joke out there from the sloppy mechanics that you're not supposed to look at your bearings before putting the cam in. And if people are following that instruction, <laughs> then they could be having issues because the, 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 you know, there might not be any um, babbit or tin or whatever left on the bearings. The bearings might be shot. That could be an issue. So no, I, I can't. I can't speak on that one. I haven't. I haven't seen any from the returns that we get here. I have not seen it. Usually, it's a it's a, a lobe due to um, the lifter going side. Well, I know in one of the previous webinars that we did, um, that question also came up, and 
uh, it was asked to one of our techs, Chuck Lynch, and I know Chuck, he's actually in the process of doing up a document right now on LS camshaft bearing failures. So uh, keep an eye out for that one, everybody. We are, we are putting a, like a, a technical bulletin style document together to, to know what to look for when there's LS camshaft bearing failures. So that one is coming and we'll have that together here pretty quick. I know Chuck's working on that. So um, another question for you, Scott, it says here, uh, when dealing with the AFM system, would it be suggested to just delete it? And they, they've mentioned here that they too have seen a lot of calls on lifters failing and have explained to the customer that uh, there are other components that can be associated to that to the failure. So they're just asking, is it best to just eliminate it? Outside of California? Um, <laughs> I guess it's probably, uh, you know, as long as you can... As long as you're still getting your emissions is probably the the safest way to say it. Uh, from a reliability standpoint, absolutely. Um, because once you get up there in the mileage, once you get outside of, um, the, you know, once you get into the rust belt, it's it's not the engine anymore. It's this. This is what it is. And that's that's beyond what what anyone as an engine builder can deal with. That could be anywhere. That could be, you know, that that the, basically what what this is. Is it's it's asking to pull a ground through some place it shouldn't be, and when it it's a ground fault interrupt. Do I say that here? I don't. But it's a ground fault interrupt. Is the the GM bulletin that came back um, that 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 says that yeah, they're, they're, with high with with corrosion, if it if it pulls a ground and that ground somehow triggers the lifter to activate or deactivate at the wrong timing, it's the next slide. That's what happens. So if you delete it, it can't happen. You know, you're, you you don't have it. And locking it out isn't necessarily the answer either. There's I've had I've had guys call. They're like, you know, well I, I went ahead and I got the tune that that locks it. Well, yeah, you can lock it, but I, I've heard guys have that failure too, because um, that might not necessarily last. Um, if if for some reason you get oil, remember it's oil that holds that thing collapsed. But if but if for some reason it tells it to turn on at the wrong timing, it could it could still go into that deactive mode, which is which is compressed. So yeah, the most number of calls that I get is from like a, I call it like a, a mom and pop car dealership, you know, that's, that's, that's a used cars that's, that's largely doing their own work on stuff that they might get from the auction or whatever that, that comes in and it's limping. It comes in and it's got a crushed lifter and um, you know, they, they fix it. They put the lifter in there. It could last, it could last 20 miles. It could last 20,000 miles, usually somewhere between 200 and 2000. A couple hundred to a couple thousand is all it's going to last before it'll do it again, more than likely. And then they call because it's crushed. And then I got to take the time to have this conversation with them that I explained. If you if they delete it, then they don't have to deal with it ever again. You know, I mean, you're not going to get that great gas mileage. I have no clue how it's going to affect your emissions because that's not a, anything that I'm remotely involved with. But deleting it you, and putting the right cam in there, again, you know, buying that kit, whichever slide that was about the kit with the uh, all of them. I don't know where it is, but the, the cam that has the uh, choosing the kit without it there. Well, then you just get to the, uh, whoops, oh, there they all are again. With the um, the kit on the right is the delete kit. You choose the right cam, single bolt, three bolt, whichever whichever cam you can get a hold of. Um, because at times the, 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 the single bolt cams aren't always available. So you might need to use a three bolt cam because of availability of the core or of the of the cam itself. And then you'll have to um, to use that different sprocket that we were talking about to get it to fit. So, yeah, deleting it. <laughs> or okay. I mean, if it's if it's something where they're concerned about it, the kit on the left is a, is the Cadillac of, of all of them. That's the best one that you can buy. No, that makes sense, Scott, for sure. Um, and that that's very similar to the kind of recommendation that we've been giving on the tech line as well. If you just completely want to eliminate the headache, you know, go the delete, and the headache is going to go away. So. Um, all right. Well, what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, Scott, we appreciate your time. I know you put a lot of effort into this presentation and, and we always appreciate, uh, when you can do stuff for us. So, um, just to respect everybody's time today, the other questions that we've got that are in the queue, we'll get those over to Scott afterwards and, uh, and Scott will get back to you. And, uh, what we'll do is we'll start to wind things down. So Scott, thank you again. appreciate it. Um, you have a thank good, you, I know you've got, you met. 
yeah, you mentioned you're you're busy here the next this weekend and upcoming. You're you're very active in in the automotive community with some of the clubs and that kind of stuff. So good luck on that stuff. And uh, Thank you. thanks again. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'm going to go back to Amanda and we'll just wind things up here for you. All right. Just real quick, everybody. Um, first off, we do post all of our webinars out to our YouTube channel. So if you haven't yet. Uh, go out, search Engine Builders Association, and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any um, upcoming webinars that get posted out there. And I do hope to have this one up by the weekend if you are keeping an eye out for it. And then lastly, when you leave, a survey will pop up. Please take a moment, fill that out. Let us know how we're doing. If there's anything else you'd like to see in this webinar, these webinars, um, it's a great spot to let us know. If you have any additional questions for the team at Elgin or the team at AERA, there is a place to ask them there as well. Um, you can also reach anyone at the AERA team by calling us at 815-526-7600, or feel free to email either myself or Rob. Our email addresses are listed there, and we will definitely make sure to route your questions to the appropriate person if we can't answer them ourselves. So with that being said, we just want to respect everybody's time. So I just want to say thank you again for attending. We know how busy you are and we appreciate you taking time out of your day. And we hope you all have a great rest of your week.